the count of monte cristo by alexander dumas chapter twenty seven the story first sir said caderousse you must make me a promise what is that inquired the abbe why if you ever make use of the details i am about to give you that you will never let any one know that it was i who supplied them for the persons of whom i am about to talk are rich and powerful and if they only laid the tips of their fingers on me i should break to pieces like glass make yourself easy my friend replied the abbe i am a priest and confessions die in my breast recollect our only desire is to carry out in a fitting manner the last wishes of our friend speak then without reserve as without hatred tell the truth the whole truth i do not know never may know the persons of whom you are about to speak besides i am an italian and not a frenchman and belong to god and not to men and i shall shortly retire to my convent which i have only quitted to fulfil the last wishes of a dying man this positive assurance seemed to give caderousse a little courage well then under these circumstances said caderousse i will i even believe i ought to undeceive you as to the friendship which poor edmund thought so sincere and unquestionable begin with his father if you please said the abbe edmund talked to me a great deal about the old man for whom he had the deepest love the history is a sad one said caderousse shaking his head perhaps you know all the earlier parts of it yes answered the abbe edmund related to me everything until the moment when he was arrested in a small cabaret close to marseilles at la reserve oh yes i can see it all before me this moment was it not his betrothal feast it was and the feast that began so gaily had a very sorrowful ending a police commissary followed by four soldiers entered and dantes was arrested yes and up to this point i know all said the priest dantes himself only knew that which personally concerned him for he never beheld again the five persons i have named to you or heard mention of any of them well when dantes was arrested monsieur morel hastened to obtain the particulars and they were very sad the old man returned alone to his home folded up his wedding suit with tears in his eyes and paced up and down his chamber the whole day and would not go to bed at all for i was underneath him and heard him walking the whole night and for myself i assure you i could not sleep either for the grief of the poor father gave me uneasiness and every step he took went to my heart as really as if his foot had pressed against my breast the next day mercedes came to implore the protection of monsieur de villefort she did not obtain it however and went to visit the old man when she saw him so miserable and heartbroken having passed a sleepless night and not touched food since the previous day she wished him to go with her that she might take care of him but the old man would not consent no was the old man's reply i will not leave this house for my poor dear boy loves me better than anything in the world and if he gets out of prison he will come and see me the first thing and what would he think if i did not wait here for him i heard all this from the window for i was anxious that mercedes should persuade the old man to accompany her for his footsteps over my head all night and day did not leave me a moment's repose but did you not go upstairs and try to console the poor old man asked the abbe ah oh, sir replied caderousse we cannot console those who will not be consoled and he was one of these besides i know not why but he seemed to dislike seeing me one night however i heard his sobs and i could not resist my desire to go up to him but when i reached his door he was no longer weeping but praying i cannot now repeat to you sir all the eloquent words and imploring language he made use of it was more than piety it was more than grief and i who am no cantor and hate the jesuits said then to myself it is really well and i am very glad that i have not any children for if i were a father and felt such excessive grief as the old man does and did not find in my memory or heart all that he is now saying i should throw myself into the sea at once for i could not bear it poor father murmured the priest from day to day he lived on alone and more and more solitary monsieur morel and mercedes came to see him but his door was closed and although i was certain he was at home he would not make any answer one day when contrary to his custom he had admitted mercedes and the poor girl in spite of her own grief and despair endeavoured to console him he said to her be assured my dear daughter he is dead and instead of expecting him it is he who is awaiting us i am quite happy for i am the oldest and of course shall see him first however well disposed a person may be you will see why we leave off after a time seeing persons who are in sorrow they make one melancholy 
and so at last old Dantes was left all to himself, and I only saw from time to time strangers go up to him and come down again with some bundle they tried to hide. But I guessed what these bundles were, and that he sold by degrees what he had to, to pay for his sustenance. At length the poor old fellow reached the end of all he had. He owed three-quarters rent, and they threatened to turn him out. He begged for another week, which was granted to him. I know this, because the landlord came into my apartment when he left his. For the first three days I heard him walking about as usual, but on the fourth I heard nothing. I then resolved to go up to him at all risks. The door was closed, but I looked through the keyhole and saw him so pale and haggard that, believing him very ill, I went and told Monsieur Morel, and then ran on to Mercedes. They both came immediately, Monsieur Morel bringing a doctor, and the doctor said it was inflammation of the bowels, and ordered him a limited diet. I was there, too, and I shall never forget the old man's smile at this prescription. From that time he received all who came. He had an excuse for not eating any more. The doctor had put him on a diet. The abbey uttered a kind of groan. "'The story interests you, does it not, sir?' inquired Gatterus. "'Yes,' replied the abbey. "'It is very affecting.' Mercedes came again, and she found him so altered that she was even more anxious than before to have him taken to her own home. This was Monsieur Morel's wish also, who would fain have conveyed the old man against his consent. But the old man resisted and cried so that they were actually frightened. Mercedes remained, therefore, by his bedside, and Monsieur Morel went away, making a sign to the Catalan that he had left his purse on the chimney-piece. But availing himself of the doctor's order, the old man would not take any sustenance. At length, after nine days of despair and fasting, the old man died, cursing those who had caused his misery, and saying to Mercedes, If you ever see my Edmund again, tell him I die blessing him. The abbey rose from his chair, made two turns round the chamber, and pressed his temp trembling hand against his parched throat. And you believe he died... "'Of hunger, sir, of hunger,' said Caderousse. "'I am as certain of it as that we two are Christians.' The abbey, with a shaking hand, seized the glass of water that was standing by him half full, swallowed it at one gulp, and then resumed his seat, with red eyes and pale cheeks. "'This was indeed a horrid event,' said he in a hoarse voice. "'The more so, sir, as it was men's and not God's doing.' "'Tell me of those men,' said the abbey, "'and remember, too,' he added in an almost menacing tone, "'you have promised to tell me everything. "'Tell me, therefore, who are these men "'who killed the son with despair "'and the father with famine? Two men jealous of him, sir, "'one from love and the other from ambition, "'Fernand and Danglars. "'How is this jealousy manifested? "'Speak on. "'They denounced Edmund as a Bonapartist agent. "'Which of the two denounced him?' Which was the real delinquent? Both, sir. One with a letter, and the other put it in the post. And where was this letter written? At La Reserve, the day before the betrothal feast. Twas so, then, twas so, then, murmured the abbey. Oh, Faria, Faria, how well did you judge men and things? What did you please to say, sir? Uh, nothing, nothing, replied the priest. Go on. It was Danglars who wrote the denunciation with his left hand, that his writing might not be recognized, and Fernand who put it in the post. But, exclaimed the abbey suddenly, you were there yourself. I, said Caderousse, astonished, who told you I was there? The abbey saw he had overshot the mark, and he added quickly, No one, but in order to have known everything so well, you must have been an eyewitness. True, true, said Caderousse in a choking voice, I was there. "'And did you not remonstrate against such infamy?' asked the abbey. "'If not, you were an accomplice.' "'Sir,' replied Caderousse, "'they had made me drink to such an excess "'that I nearly lost all perception. "'I had only an indistinct understanding "'of what was passing around me. "'I said all that a man in such a state could say, "'but they both assured me that it was a jest "'they were carrying on, and perfectly harmless. "'Next day, next day, sir, you must have seen plain enough what they had been doing, yet you said nothing, though you were present when Dantes was arrested.' "'Yes, sir. I was there, and very anxious to speak, but Danglars restrained me. "'If he should really be guilty,' said he, and did really put into the island of Elba, "'if he is really charged with a letter for the Bonapartist Committee at Paris, "'and if they find this letter upon him, those who have supported him will pass for his accomplices.' 
I confess I had my fears in the state in which politics then were, and I held my tongue. It was cowardly, I confess, but it was not criminal. I understand. You allowed matters to take their course, that was all. Yes, sir, answered Caderousse, and remorse preys on me night and day. I often ask pardon of God, I swear to you, because this action, the only one with which I have seriously to reproach myself in all my life, is no doubt the cause of my abject condition. I am expiating a moment of selfishness, and so I always say to La Carconte, when she complains, Hold your tongue, woman, it is the will of God. And Caderousse bowed his head with every sign of real repentance. Well, sir, said the abbe, you have spoken unreservedly, and thus to accuse yourself is to deserve pardon. Unfortunately, Edmund is dead, and has not pardoned me. He did not know, said the abbe. But he knows it all now, interrupted Caderousse. They say the dead know everything. There was a brief silence. The abbe rose and paced up and down pensively, and then resumed his seat. You have two or three times mentioned a Monsieur Morel, he said. Who is he? The owner of the Pharaon and patron of Dante's. And what part did he play in this sad drama? inquired the abbe. The part of an honest man, full of courage and real regard, twenty times he interceded for Edmund. When the emperor returned, he wrote, implored, threatened, and so energetically that on the second restoration he was persecuted as a Bonapartist. Ten times, as I told you, he came to see Dante's father, and offered to receive him in his own house, and the night or two before his death, as I have already said, he left his purse on the mantelpiece, with which they paid the old man's debts, and buried him decently. And so Edmund's father died, as he had lived, without doing harm to any one. I have the purse still by me, a large one, made of red silk. And, asked the abbe, is Monsieur Morel still alive? Yes, replied Caderousse. In that case, replied the abbe, he should be rich and happy. Caderousse smiled bitterly. Yes, happy as myself, said he. What? Monsieur Morel unhappy? exclaimed the abbe. He is reduced almost to the last extremity. Nay, he is almost at the point of dishonor. How? Yes, continued Caderousse, so it is. After five and twenty years of labor, after having acquired a most honorable name in the trade of Marseille, Monsieur Morel is utterly ruined. He has lost five ships in two years, has suffered by the bankruptcy of three large houses, and his only hope now is in that very pharaoh which poor Dante has commanded, and which is expected from the Indies with a cargo of cochineal and indigo. If this ship founders like the others, he is a ruined man. And has the unfortunate man wife or children? inquired the abbe. Yes, he has a wife, who through everything has behaved like an angel. He has a daughter, who is about to marry the man she loved, but whose family now will not allow him to wed the daughter of a ruined man. And he has besides a son a lieutenant in the army, and, as you may suppose, all this, instead of lessening, only augments his sorrows. If he were alone in the world, he would blow out his brains, and there would be an end. Horrible! ejaculated the priest. And it is thus heaven recompenses virtue, sir, added Caderousse. You see, I, who never did a bad action, but that I have told you of, am in destitution with my poor wife, dying a fever before my very eyes, and I unable to do anything in the world for her. I shall die of hunger, as old Dantes did, while Fernand and Danglars are rolling in wealth. How is that? Because their deeds have brought them good fortune, while honest men have been reduced to misery. What has become of Danglars, the instigator, and therefore the most guilty? What has become of him? Why, he left Marseilles and was taken on the recommendation of Monsieur Morel, who did not know his crime, as cashier into a Spanish bank. During the war with Spain, he was employed in the commissariat of the French army, and made a fortune. Then, with that money, he speculated in the funds, and trebled or quadrupled his capital, and having first married his banker's daughter, who left him a widower, he has married a second time a widow, a Madame de Nargon, daughter of Monsieur de Servieux, the king's chamberlain, who is in high favor at court. He is now a millionaire, and they have made him a baron and now he is the Baron Danglars, with a fine residence in the Rue de Mont Blanc, with ten horses in his stables, six footmen in his antechamber, and I know not how many millions in his strong box. Ah, uh, said the abbe in a peculiar tone, he is happy. Happy? Who can answer for that? Happiness or unhappiness is the secret known but to oneself and the walls. Walls have ears, but no tongues. But if a large fortune 
produces happiness, Danglars is happy. And Fernand? Fernand? Why, much the same story. But how could a poor Catalan fisher boy without education or resources make a fortune? I confess this staggers me. And it has staggered everyone. There must have been in his life some strange secret that no one knows. But then, by what visible steps has he attained this high fortune or high position? Both, sir. He has both fortune and position. Both. This must be impossible. It would seem so. But listen, and you will understand. Some days before the return of the emperor, Fernand was drafted. The Bourbons let him quietly enough at the Catalans, but when Napoleon returned, a special levy was made, and Fernand was compelled to join. I went too, but as I was older than Fernand, and had just married my poor wife, I was only sent to the coast. Fernand was enrolled in the active troop, went to the frontier with his regiment, and was at the Battle of Ligny. A night after the battle, he was sent at the door of a general who carried on a secret correspondence with the enemy. That same night, the general was to go over to the English. He proposed to Fernand to accompany him. Fernand agreed to do so, deserted his post, and followed the general. Fernand would have been court-martialed if Napoleon had remained on the throne, but his action was rewarded by the Bourbons. He returned to France with, with the épaule of sub-lieutenant, and as the protection of the general, who is in the highest favor, was accorded to him, he was a captain in 1823, during the Spanish War, that is to say, at the time when Danglars made his early speculations. Fernand was a Spaniard, and being sent to Spain to ascertain the feeling of his fellow countrymen, found Danglars there, but on very intimate terms with him, won over the support of the royalists of the capital and in the provinces, received promises and made pledges on his own part, guided his regiment by paths known to himself alone through the mountain gorges which were held by the royalists, and, in fact, rendered such services in this brief campaign that after the taking of Trocadero he was made colonel, and received the title of count and the cross of an officer of the Legion of Honor. Destiny, destiny, murmured the abbey. Yes, but listen, this was not all. The war with Spain being ended, Fernand's career was checked by the long peace which seemed likely to endure throughout Europe. Greece only had risen against Turkey and had begun her war of independence. All eyes were turned towards Athens. It was the fashion to pity and support the Greeks. The French government, without protecting them openly, as you know, gave countenance to volunteer assistance. Fernand sought and obtained leave to go and serve in Greece, still having his name kept on the army roll. Some time after, it was stated that the Comte de Morcerf, this was the name he bore, had entered the service of Ali Pasha with the rank of instructor general. Ali Pasha was killed, as you know, but before he died, he recompensed the services of Fernand by leaving him a considerable sum, with which he returned to France when he was gazetted lieutenant-general. So that now, inquired the abbey, so that now, continued Caderousse, he owns a magnificent house, Nombre Vance, Rue de Elder, Paris. The abbey opened his mouth, hesitated for a moment, then making an effort at self-control, he said, And Mercedes, they tell me that she has disappeared. Disappeared, said Caderousse, yes. As the sun disappears, to rise the next day with still more splendor. Has she made a fortune also? inquired the abbe with an ironical smile. Mercedes is at this moment one of the greatest ladies in Paris, replied Caderousse. Go on, said the abbe. It seems as if I were listening to the story of a dream, but I have seen things so extraordinary that what you tell me seems less astonishing than it otherwise might. Mercedes was at first in the deepest despair at the blow which deprived her of Edmund. I have told you of her attempts to propitiate Monsieur de Villefort, her devotion to the elder Dantes, and the midst of her despair a new affliction overtook her. This was the departure of Fernand, a Fernand whose crime she did not know, and whom she regarded as her brother. Fernand went, and Mercedes remained alone. Three months passed, and still she wept. No news of Edmund, no news of Fernand no companionship save that of an old man who was dying with despair one evening after a day of accustomed vigil at the angle of two roads leading to marseilles from the catalans she returned to her home more depressed than ever suddenly she heard a step she knew turned anxiously around the door opened and fernand dressed in the uniform of a sub-lieutenant stood before her it was not the one she wished for most but it seemed as if a part of her past life had returned to her Mercedes seized Fernand's hands with a transport which he took for love, 
but which was only joy at being no longer alone in the world, and seeing at last a friend, after long hours of solitary sorrow, and then, it must be confessed, for Nan had never been hated, who was only not precisely loved. Another possessed all Mercedes' heart. That other was absent, had disappeared, perhaps was dead. At this last thought, Mercedes burst into a flood of tears and wrung her hands in agony, but the thought, which she had always repelled before when it was suggested to her by another, came now in full force upon her mind. And then, too, old Dante's incessantly said to her, Our Edmund is dead. If he were not, he would return to us. The old man died, as I have told you. Had he lived, Mercedes, perchance, had not become the wife of another, for he would have been there to reproach her infidelity. Fernand saw this, and when he learned of the old man's death, he returned. He was now lieutenant. At his first coming he had not said a word of love to Mercedes. At the second he reminded her that he loved her. Mercedes begged for six months more in which to await and mourn for Edmund. So that, said the abbey with a bitter smile, that makes eighteen months in all. What more could the most devoted lover desire? Then he murmured the words of the English poet, Frailty, thy name is woman. Six months afterward, continued Caderousse, the marriage took place in the church of Acouse. The very church in which she was to have married Edmund, murmured the priest. There was only a change of bridegrooms. Well, Mercedes was married, proceeded Caderousse, but although in the eyes of the world she appeared calm, she nearly fainted as she passed La Reserve, where eighteen months before the betrothal had been celebrated with him whom she might have known she still loved had she looked to the bottom of her heart. For none more happy, but not more at his ease, for I saw it at this time he was in constant dread of Edmund's return. Fernand was very anxious to get his wife away and to depart himself. There were too many unpleasant possibilities associated with the Catalans, and eight days after the wedding they left Marseilles. "'Did you ever see Mercedes again?' inquired the priest. "'Yes, during the Spanish War at Perpignan, where Fernand had left her, she was attending to the education of her son.' The abbey started. "'Her son?' said he. "'Yes,' replied Caderousse. "'Little Albert.' But then, to be able to instruct her child, continued the abbey, she must have received an education herself. I understood from Edmund that she was the daughter of a simple fisherman, beautiful but uneducated. Oh, replied Caderousse, did he know so little of his lovely betrothed? Mercedes might have been a queen, sir, if the, qu if the crown were to be placed on the heads of the loveliest and most intelligent. Fernand's fortune was already waxing great, and she developed with his growing fortune. She learned drawing, music, everything. Besides, I believe, between ourselves, she did this in order to distract her mind, that she might forget, and she only filled her head in order to alleviate the weight on her heart. But now her position in life is assured, continued Caderousse. No doubt fortune and honors have comforted her. She is rich, a countess, and yet— Caderousse paused. And yet what? asked the abbe. Yet I am sure she is not happy, said Caderousse. What makes you believe this? Why, when I found myself utterly destitute, I thought my old friends would perhaps assist me. So I went to danglers who would not even receive me. I called on Fernand, who sent me a hundred francs by his valet de chambre. Then you did not see either of them? No. But Madame de Morcerf saw me. How was that? As I went away, a purse fell at my feet. It contained five and twenty louis. I raised my head quickly and saw Mercedes, who at once shut the blind. "'And Monsieur de Villefort?' asked the abbey. "'Oh, he never was a friend of mine. I did not know him, and I had nothing to ask of him. "'Do you not know what became of him and the share he had in Edmund's misfortunes?' "'No, I only know that some time after Edmund's arrest he married Mademoiselle de saint Meron, "'and soon after left Marseilles. "'No doubt he has been as lucky as the rest. "'No doubt he is as rich as Danglars, as high in station as Fernand. "'I only, as you see, have remained poor, wretched, and forgotten.' "'You are mistaken, my friend,' replied the abbey. "'God may seem sometimes to forget for a time while his justice reposes, "'but there always comes a moment when he remembers, and behold, a proof.' "'As he spoke, the abbey took the diamond from his pocket, "'and, giving it to Caderousse, said, "'Here, my friend, take this diamond, it is yours.' "'What, for me only?' cried Caderousse. "'Ah, sir, do not jest with me.' "'This diamond was to have been shared among his friends. "'Edmund had one friend only,' and thus it cannot be divided. Take the diamond, then, and sell it. It is worth fifty thousand francs, and I repeat my wish that this sum may suffice to release you from your wretchedness. 
"'Oh, sir,' said Caderousse, putting out one hand timidly, and with the other wiping away the perspiration which bedewed his brow, "'Oh, sir, do not make jests of the happiness or despair of a man. I know what happiness and what despair are, and I never make a jest of such feelings. Take it, then, but in exchange—' Caderousse, who touched the diamond, withdrew his hand. The abbey smiled. "'In exchange,' he continued, "'give me the red silk purse that Monsieur Morel left on old Dante's chimney-piece, and which you tell me is still in your hands.' Caderousse, more and more astonished, went toward a large oaken cupboard, opened it, and gave the abbey a long purse of faded red silk, round which were two copper runners that had once been gilt. The abbey took it, and in return gave Caderousse the diamond. "'Oh, you are a man of God, sir,' cried Caderousse, "'for no one knew that Edmund had given you this diamond, and you might have kept it.' which said the abbey to himself you would have done the abbey rose took his hat and gloves well he said all you have told me is perfectly true then and i may believe it in every particular see sir replied caderousse in this corner is a crucifix in holy wood here on this shelf is my wife's testament open this book and i will swear upon it with my hand on the crucifix i will swear to you by my soul's salvation my faith as a christian i have told everything to you as it occurred and as the recording angel will tell it to the ear of God at the day of the last judgment. "'Tis well,' said the abbey, convinced by his manner and tone that Caderousse spoke the truth. "'Tis well, and may this money profit you. Adieu! I go far from men who thus so bitterly injure each other.' The abbey with difficulty got away from the enthusiastic thanks of Caderousse, opened the door himself, got out, and mounted his horse once more saluted the innkeeper who kept uttering his loud farewells and then returned by the road he had travelled in coming when caderousse turned around he saw behind him la carconte paler and trembling more than ever is then all that i have heard really true she inquired what that he has given the diamond to us only inquired caderousse half bewildered with joy yes nothing more true see here it is the woman gazed at his moment, and then said, in a gloomy voice, "'Suppose it's false?' And Caderousse started and turned pale. "'False?' he muttered. "'False? Why should that man give me a false diamond? "'To get your secret without paying for it, you blockhead!' Caderousse remained for a moment aghast under the weight of such an idea. "'Oh,' he said, taking up his hat, which he placed on the red handkerchief tied round his head, "'we will soon find out in what way.' Why, the fair is on at Beaucaire. There are always jewelers from Paris there, and I will show it to them. Look after the house, wife, and I shall be back in two hours. And Caderousse left the house in haste, and ran rapidly in the direction opposite to that which the priests had taken. Fifty thousand francs, muttered La Carconte, when left alone. It is a large sum of money, but it is not a fortune. End of chapter 27 Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 28 The Prison Register The day after that in which the scene we have just described had taken place on the road between Bellegarde and Beaucaire, a man of about thirty, or two and thirty, dressed in a bright blue frock coat, nankeen trousers, and a white waistcoat, having the appearance and accent of an Englishman, presented himself before the mayor of Marseilles. Sir, said he, I am chief clerk of the house of Thompson and French of Rome. We are, and have been these ten years, connected with the house of Morel and son of Marseilles. We have a hundred thousand francs or thereabouts loaned on their securities, and we are a little uneasy at the reports which have reached us that the firm is on the brink of ruin. I have come, therefore, expressed from Rome, to ask you for information. Sir, replied the mayor. I know very well that during the last four or five years misfortune has seemed to pursue Monsieur Morel. He has lost four or five vessels, and has suffered by three or four bankruptcies, but it is not for me, although I am a creditor myself to the amount of ten thousand francs, to give any information as to the state of his finances. Ask me, as mayor, what is my opinion of Monsieur Morel and I shall say that he is a man honourable to the last degree, and who has, up to this time, fulfilled every engagement with scrupulous punctuality. That is all I can say, sir. If you wish to know more, address yourself to Monsieur de Beauville, the inspector of prisons, number 15, Rue de Nouet. 
He has, I believe, two hundred thousand francs in Morel's hands, and if there be any grounds for apprehension, as this is a greater amount than mine, you will most probably find him better informed than myself. The Englishman seemed to appreciate this extreme delicacy, made his bow, and went away, proceeding with the characteristic British stride toward the street mentioned. Monsieur de Beauvais was in his private room, and the Englishman, on perceiving him, made a gesture of surprise which seemed to indicate that it was not the first time he had been in his presence. As to Monsieur de Beauvais, he was in such a state of despair that it was evident that all the faculties of his mind, absorbed in the thought which occupied them at the moment, did not allow either his memory or his imagination to stray into the past. The Englishman, with the coolness of his nation, addressed him in terms nearly similar to those with which he had accosted the mayor of Marseilles. "'Oh, sir!' exclaimed M. de Beauvais. "'Your fears are unfortunately but too well founded, and you see before you a man in despair. I had two hundred thousand francs placed in the hands of Morel and son. These two hundred thousand francs were the dowry of my daughter, who was to be married in a fortnight, and these two hundred thousand francs were payable half on the fifteenth of this month, the other half on the fifteenth of next month. I had informed M. Morel of my desire to have these payments punctually, and he has been here within the last half hour to tell me that if his ship, the Pharaon, does not come into port on the fifteenth, he will be wholly unable to make this payment. But, said the Englishman, this looks very much like a suspension of payment. It looks more like bankruptcy, exclaimed M. de Beauville despairingly. The Englishman appeared to reflect a moment, and said, From which it would appear, sir, that this credit inspires you with considerable apprehension. To tell the truth, I consider it lost. Well, then, I will buy it of you. You? Yes, I. But at a tremendous discount, of course. No, for two hundred thousand francs. Our house, added the Englishman with a laugh, does not do things that way. And you will pay? Ready money. And the Englishman withdrew from his pocket a bundle of bank-notes, which might have been twice the sum M. de Beauville feared to lose. A ray of joy passed across M. de Beauville's countenance, yet he made an effort at self-control, and said, "'Sir, I ought to tell you that in all probability you will not realize six per cent of this sum.' "'That's no affair of mine,' replied the Englishman. "'That is the affair of the houses of Thompson and French, in whose name I act. They have, perhaps, some motive to serve in hastening the ruin of a rival firm, but all I know, sir, is that I am ready to hand you over this sum in exchange for your assignment of the debt. I only ask a brokerage. Well, of course, that is perfectly just, cried Monsieur de Beauville. The commission is usually one and a half. Will you have two, three, five per cent, even more, whatever you say? Sir, replied the Englishman, laughing, I am like my house. I do not do such things. No, the commission that I ask is quite different. Name it, sir, I beg. You are the inspector of prisons? I have been so these fourteen years. You keep the registers of entries and departures? I do. To these registers there are added notes relative to the prisoners? There are special reports on every prisoner. Well, sir, I was educated at home by a poor devil of an abbe who disappeared suddenly. I have since learned that he was confined in the Chateau d'If, and I should like to learn some particulars of his death. What was his name? The Abbe Faria. Oh, I recall him perfectly, cried Monsieur de Beauvais. He was crazy. So they said. Oh, he was, decidedly. Very possibly. What sort of madness was it? He pretended to know of an immense treasure, and offered vast sums to the government if they would liberate him. Poor devil! And he is dead? Yes, sir, five or six months ago, last February. You have a good memory, sir, to recall dates so well. I recall this because the poor devil's death was accompanied by a singular incident. May I ask what that was? said the Englishman, with an expression of curiosity, which a close observer would have been astonished at discovering in his phlegmatic countenance. Oh, dear, yes, sir! 
the abbe's dungeon was forty or fifty feet distant from that which one of Bonaparte's emissaries, one of those who had contributed the most to the return of the usurper in 1815, a very resolute and very dangerous man. Indeed, said the Englishman. Yes, replied Monsieur de Beauville. I myself had occasion to see this man in 1816 or 1817, and we could only go into his dungeon with a file of soldiers. That man made a deep impression on me. I shall never forget his countenance. The Englishman smiled imperceptibly. As you say, sir, he interposed, that the two dungeons were separated by a distance of fifty feet, but it appears that this Edmond Dantes, this dangerous man's name was Edmond Dantes. It appears, sir, that this Edmond Dantes had procured tools, or had made them, for they found a tunnel through which the prisoners held communication with one another. This tunnel was dug, no doubt, with an intention of escape? No doubt. But unfortunately for the prisoners, the Abbe Fari had an attack of catalepsy and died. That must have cut short the projects of escape. Well, for the dead man, yes, replied Monsieur de Beauville. But not for the survivor. On the contrary, this Dante saw means of accelerating his escape. He no doubt thought that prisoners who died in the Chateau d'If were interred in an ordinary burial ground, and he conveyed the dead man into his own cell, took his place in the sack in which they sewed up the corpse, and awaited the moment of interment. It was a bold step, one that showed some courage, remarked the Englishman. As I have already told you, sir, he was a very dangerous man, and fortunately by his own act disembarrassed the government of the fears it had on his account. How was that? How? Do you not comprehend? No. The Chateau d'If has no cemetery. They simply throw the dead into the sea after fastening a thirty-six pound cannonball to their feet. Well, observed the Englishman as if he were slow of comprehension. Well, they fasten the thirty-six pound ball to his feet and throw him into the sea. Really? exclaimed the Englishman. Yes, sir, continued the inspector of prisons. You may imagine the amazement of the fugitive when he found himself flung headlong over the rocks. I should like to have seen his face at that moment. That would have been difficult. No matter, replied de Beauville, in supreme good humor at the certainty of recovering his two hundred thousand francs. No matter, I can fancy it. And he shouted with laughter. So can I, said the Englishman. And he laughed, too. But he laughed as the English do, at the end of his teeth. And so, continued the Englishman, who first gained his composure, he has drowned? Unquestionably. So that the governor got rid of the dangerous and the crazy prisoner at the same time. Precisely. "'But some official document was drawn up as to this affair, I suppose?' inquired the Englishman. "'Yes, yes, the mortuary deposition. You understand Dante's relations, if he had any, might have some interest in knowing if he were dead or alive. So that now, if there were anything to inherit from him, they might do it with easy conscience. He is dead, and no mistake about it. Oh, yes, and they may have the fact attested whenever they please. So be it.' said the Englishman. But to return to these registers, true, the story has diverted our attention from them. Excuse me. Excuse you for what? For the story? By no means. It really seems to me very curious. Yes, indeed. So, sir, you wish to see all relating to the poor Abbe, who really was gentleness itself? Yes, you will much oblige me. Go into the study there, and I will show it to you. And they both entered Monsieur de Beauvais's study. Everything there arranged in perfect order. Each register had its number, each file of papers its place. The inspector begged the Englishman to seat himself in an armchair, and placed before him the register and documents relative to the Chateau d'If, giving him all the time he desired for the examination, while de Beauvais seated himself in a corner and began to read his newspaper. The Englishman easily found the entries relative to the Abbe Faria, but it seemed that the history which the inspector had related interested him greatly, for, 
After having pursued the first documents, he turned over the leaves until he reached the deposition regarding Edmund Dantes. There he found everything arranged in due order. The accusation, examination, Morel's petition, Monsieur de Villefort's marginal notes. He folded up the accusation quietly, and put it as quietly in his pocket. Read the examination, and saw that the name of Nortier was not mentioned in it. Perused, too, the application dated 10th April, 1815, in which Morel, by the deputy procurer's advice, exaggerated with the best of intentions, for Napoleon was then on the throne, the services Dantes had rendered to the imperial cause, services which Villefort's certificates rendered indispensable. Then he saw through the whole thing. This petition to Napoleon, kept back by Villefort, to become, under the Second Restoration, a terrible weapon against him in the hands of the king's attorney. He was no longer astonished when he searched on to find in the register this note, placed in a bracket against his name. Edmund Dantes, an inveterate Bonapartist, took an active part in the return from the island of Elba, to be kept in strict solitary confinement, and to be closely watched and guarded. Beneath these lines was written in another hand, See note above, nothing can be done. He compared the writing in the bracket with the writing of the certificate placed beneath Morel's petition, and discovered that the note in the bracket was in the same writing as the certificate. That is to say, it was Villefort's handwriting. As to the note which accompanied this, the Englishman understood that it might have been added by some inspector, who had taken a momentary interest in Dante's situation, but who had, from the remarks we have quoted, found it impossible to give any effect to the interest he had felt. As we have said, the inspector, from discretion, and that he might not disturb the Abbe Faria's pupil in his researches, had seated himself in a corner, and was reading Le Drapeau Blanc. He did not see the Englishman fold up and place in his pocket the accusation written by Danglars under the arbor of La Reserve, and which had the postmark Marseille, 27th February, delivery 6 o'clock p.m. But it must be said that, if he had seen it, he attached so little importance to this scrap of paper, and so much importance to his two hundred thousand francs, that he would not have opposed whatever the Englishman might do, however irregular it might be. "'Thanks,' said the latter, closing the register with a slam. "'I have all I want. Now it is for me to perform my promise. Give me a simple assignment of your debt, acknowledge therein the receipt of the cash, and I will hand over to you the money.' He rose and gave his seat to M. Bovy, who took it without ceremony, and quickly drew up the required assignment, while the Englishman counted out the banknotes on the other side of the desk. So ends Chapter 28, The Prison Register. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 29 The House of Morel and Son Anyone who had quitted Marseilles a few years previously, well acquainted with the interior of Morel's warehouse, and had returned at this date, would have found a great change. Instead of that air of life, of comfort, and of happiness that permeates a flourishing and prosperous business establishment, instead of merry faces at the windows, busy clerks hurrying to and fro in the long corridors, instead of the court filled with bales of goods re-echoing with the cries and jokes of porters, one would have immediately perceived all aspects of sadness and gloom. Out of all the numerous clerks that used to fill the deserted corridor and the empty office, but two remained. One was a young man of three or four and twenty, who was in love with Monsieur Morel's daughter, and had remained with him in spite of the efforts of his friends to induce him to withdraw. The other was an old one-eyed cashier called Cocle, or Cockeye, a nickname given him by the young men who used to throng his vast and now almost deserted beehive, and which had so completely replaced his real name 
that he would not in all probability have replied to any one who addressed him by it. Cochle remained in M. Morel's service, and a most singular change had taken place in his position. He had, at the same time, risen to the rank of cashier, and sunk to the rank of a servant. He was, however, the same Cochle, good, patient, devoted, but inflexible on the subject of arithmetic, the only point on which he would have stirred firm against the world, even against M. Morel, and strong in the multiplication table which he had at his fingers' ends, no matter what scheme or what trap was laid to catch him. In the midst of the disasters that befell the house, Cochle was the only one unmoved. But this did not arise from a want of affection. On the contrary, from a firm conviction. Like the rats that one by one forsake the doomed ship even before the vessel weighs anchor, so all the numerous clerks had by degrees deserted the office and the warehouse. Cochle had seen them go without thinking of inquiring the cause of their departure. Everything was as we have said, a question of arithmetic to Cocles, and during the twenty years he had always seen all payments made with such exactitude that it seemed as impossible to him that the house should stop payment as that it would to a miller that the river that had so long turned his mill should cease to flow. Nothing had as yet occurred to shake Cocles' belief. The last month's payment had been made with the most scrupulous exactitude. Cochle had detected an overbalance of fourteen sous in his cash, and the same evening he had brought them to M. Morel, who, with a melancholy smile, threw them into the almost empty drawer, saying, "'Thanks, Cochle's. You are the pearl of cashiers.' Cochle's went away perfectly happy, for this eulogium of M. Morel, himself the pearl of the honest men of Marseilles, flattered him more than a present of fifty crowns, but since the end of the month M. Morel had passed on many an anxious hour. In order to meet the payments then due, he had collected all his resources, and, fearing lest the report of his distress should get bruited about at Marseilles when he was known to be reduced to such an extremity, he went to the Bocheret Fair to sell his wife's and daughter's jewels and a portion of his plate. By this means the end of the month was past, but his resources were now exhausted. Credit, owing to the reports afloat, was no longer to be had, and to meet the one hundred thousand francs due at the tenth of the present month, and the one hundred thousand francs due on the fifteenth of the next month to Monsieur de Boisville, M. Morel had in reality no hope but the return of the Faron, of whose departure he had learnt from a vessel which had weighed anchor at the same time, and which had already arrived in harbour. But this vessel, like the Faron, came from Calcutta, and had been in for a fortnight, while no intelligence had been received of the Faron. Such was the state of his affairs, when, the day after his interview with M. de Boisville, the confidential clerk of the house of Thompson and French of Rome presented himself at M. Morel's. Emmanuel received him. This young man was alarmed by the appearance of every new face, for every new face might be that of a new creditor, come in anxiety to question the head of the house. The young man, wishing to spare his employer the pain of this interview, questioned the newcomer, but the stranger declared that he had nothing to say to M. Emmanuel, and that his business was with M. Morel in person. Emmanuel sighed and summoned Cocles. Cocles appeared, and the young man bade him conduct the stranger to M. Morel's apartment. Cocles went first, and the stranger followed him. On the staircase they met a beautiful girl of sixteen or seventeen, who looked with anxiety at the stranger. M. Morel is in his room, is he not, Mademoiselle Julie? said the cashier. Yes, I think so, at least, said the young girl, hesitatingly. Go and see, Cocles, if my father is there. Announce the gentleman. It will be useless to announce me, mademoiselle, returned the Englishman. Monsieur Morel does not know my name. This worthy gentleman has only to announce the confidential clerk of the house of Thompson and French of Rome, with whom your father does business. 
The young girl turned pale and continued to descend, while the stranger and Coquelet continued to mount the staircase. She entered the office where Emmanuel was, while Coquelet, by the aid of a key he possessed, opened a door in the corner of a landing-place on the second staircase, conducted the stranger into an antechamber, opened a second door, which he closed behind him, and, after having left the clerk of the house of Thompson and French alone, returned and signed to him that he could enter. The Englishman entered, and found Morel seated at a table, turning over the formidable columns of his ledger, which contained the list of his liabilities. At the sight of the stranger, M. Morel closed the ledger, arose, and offered a seat to the stranger, and, when he had seen him seated, resumed to his own chair. Fourteen years had changed the worthy merchant, who, in his thirty-sixth year at the opening of this history, now was in his fiftieth. His hair had turned white, and his sorrow had ploughed deep furrows on his brow, and his look, once so firm and penetrating, was now irresolute and wandering, as if he feared being forced to fix his attention on some particular thought or person. The Englishman looked at him with an air of curiosity, evidently mingled with interest. Monsieur, said Morel, whose uneasiness was increased by this examination, you wish to speak to me? Yes, monsieur. You are aware from where I come? The house of Thompson and French, at least so my cashier tells me. He has told you rightly. The house of Thompson and French had three hundred or four hundred thousand francs to pay this month in France, and knowing your strict punctuality, have collected all the bills bearing your signature, and charged me, as they became due, to present them, and to employ the money otherwise. Morel sighed deeply, and passed his hand over his forehead, which was covered with perspiration. "'So then, sir,' said Morel, "'you hold bills of mine?' "'Yes, and for a considerable sum.' "'What is the amount?' asked Morel, with a voice he strove to render firm. "'Here it is,' said the Englishman, taking a quantity of papers from his pocket. "'An assignment of two hundred thousand francs to our house by Monsieur de Boisville, the inspector of prisons, to whom they are due. You acknowledge, of course, that you owe this sum to him?' "'Yes. He placed the money in my hands at four and a half per cent nearly five years ago. "'When are you to pay?' "'Half the fifteenth of this month.' half the fifteenth of next. Just so. And now there are thirty-two thousand five hundred francs payable shortly. They are all signed by you, and assigned to our house by the holders. I recognize them, said Morel, whose face was suffused, as he thought that, for the first time in his life, he would be unable to honor his own signature. Is that all? No. I have, for the end of the month, these bills, which have been assigned to us by the house of Pascal, and the house of Wilde and Turner of Marseilles, amounting to nearly fifty-five thousand francs, in all two hundred and eighty-seven thousand five hundred francs. It is impossible to describe what Morel suffered during this enumeration. Two hundred and eighty-seven thousand five hundred francs, repeated he. Yes, sir, repeated the Englishman. I will not, continued he, after a moment's silence, conceal from you that while your probity and exactitude up to this moment are universally acknowledged, yet the report is current in Marseilles that you are not able to meet your liabilities. At this almost brutal speech Morel turned deathly pale. Sir, he said, up to this time, and it is now more than four and twenty years since I received the direction of this house from my father, who had himself conducted it for five and thirty years, Never has anything bearing the signature of Morel and Son been dishonoured. I know that, replied the Englishman, but as a man of honour you should answer another. Tell me fairly, shall you pay these with the same punctuality? Morel shuddered, and looked at the man who spoke with more assurance than he had hitherto shown. To questions frankly put, said he, a straightforward answer should be given. Yes, I shall pay, if, as I hope, my vessel arrives safely, for its arrival will again procure me the credit which the numerous accidents of which I have been the victim have deprived me. 
But if the Farron should be lost, and this last resource be gone, the poor man's eyes filled with tears. Well, said the other, if this last resource fail you? Well, returned Morel, it is a cruel thing to be forced to say, but already used to misfortune I must habituate myself to shame. I fear I shall be forced to suspend payment. Have you no friends who could assist you? Morel smiled mournfully. In business, sir, said he, one has no friends, only correspondence. It is true, murmured the Englishman. Then you have but one hope. But one. The last? The last. So that if this fail, I am ruined, completely ruined. And as I was on my way here, a vessel was coming into port. I know it, sir. A young man who still adheres to my fallen fortune passes a part of his time in a belvedere at the top of the house in hopes of being the first to announce good news to me. He has informed me of the arrival of this ship. And it is not yours? No, she is a Bordeaux vessel, La Gironde. She comes from India also, but she is not mine. Perhaps she has spoken the Farron, and brings you some tidings of her. Shall I tell you plainly one thing, sir? I dread almost as much to receive any tidings of my vessel as to remain in doubt. Uncertainty is still hope. Then in a low voice Morel added, This delay is not natural. The Farron left Calcutta 5th of February. She ought to have been here a month ago. What is that? said the Englishman. What is the meaning of that noise? Oh! Oh! cried Morel, turning pale. What is it? A loud noise was heard on the stairs of people moving hastily and half-stifled sobs. Morel rose and advanced to the door, but his strength failed him as he sank to the chair. The two men remained opposite one another, Morel trembling in every limb, the stranger gazing at him with an air of profound pity. The noise had ceased, but it seemed that Morel expected something. Something had occasioned the noise, and something must follow. The stranger fancied he heard footsteps on the stairs, and that the footsteps, which were those of several persons, stopped at the door. A key was inserted into the lock of the first door, and the creaking of the hinges was audible. "'There are only two persons who have the key to that door,' murmured Morel, "'Cocles and Julie.' At this instant the second door opened, and the young girl, her eyes bathed with tears, appeared. Morel rose, trembling, supporting himself by the arm of the chair. He would have spoken, but his voice failed him. "'Oh, father,' said she, clasping her hands, "'forgive your child for being the bearer of evil tidings.' Morel again changed color. Julie threw herself into his arms. "'Oh, father!' Father, murmured she, courage. The Farron has gone down, then, said Morel in a hoarse voice. The young girl did not speak, but she made an affirmative sign with her head as she lay on her father's breast. And the crew? asked Morel. Saved, said the girl, saved by the crew of the vessel that has just entered the harbor. Morel raised his two hands to heaven with an expression of resignation and sublime gratitude. "'Thanks, my God,' said he. "'At least thou strikest but me alone.' A tear moistened the eye of the phlegmatic Englishman. "'Come in, come in,' said Morel, "'for I presume you are all at the door.' Scarcely had he uttered those words when Madame Morel entered weeping bitterly. Emmanuel followed her, and in the antechamber were visible the rough faces of seven or eight half-naked sailors. At the sight of these men the Englishman started and advanced a step, then restrained himself, and retired into the farthest and most obscure corner of the apartment. Madame Morel sat down by her husband, and took one of his hands in hers. Julie still lay with her head on his shoulder. 
Emmanuel stood in the center and seemed to form the link between Morel's family and the sailors at the door. "'How did this happen?' said Morel. "'Draw nearer, Penelon,' said the young man, "'and tell us all about it.' An old seaman, bronzed by the tropical sun, advanced, twirling the remains of a tarpaulin between his hands. "'Good day, Mr. Morel,' said he, as if he had just quitted Marseilles the previous evening and had just returned from A or Toulon. "'Good day, Penelon,' returned Morel, who could not refrain from smiling through his tears. "'Where is the captain?' "'The captain, Monsieur Morel, has stayed back, sick, at the Palma. "'But please, God, it won't be much, "'and you will see him in a few days, all alive and hearty. "'Well, now, tell your story, Penelon.' "'Penelon rolled his quid in his cheek, "'placed his hand before his mouth, "'turned his head, and set a long jet of tobacco-juice "'into the antechamber, advanced his foot, "'balanced himself, and began— "'You see, Monsieur Morel,' said he, "'we were somewhere between Cap Blanc and Cap Boyador, "'sailing with a fair breeze south-southwest after a week's calm, "'when Captain Gaumont comes up and says to me, "'I was at the helm, I should tell you, "'and says, Penelon, what do you think of these clouds coming up over here?' "'I was just then looking at them myself. "'What do I say, Captain? "'Why, I think they are rising faster than they have any business to do.' and that they would not be so black if they didn't mean mischief. "'That's my opinion, too,' said the captain. "'I'll take precautions accordingly. "'We are carrying too much canvas. "'Of us, they are all hands. "'Take in the studding sills. "'Bestow the flying jib.' "'It was time. "'The squall was on us, and the vessel began to heel. "'Ah!' paid the captain. "'We have still too much canvas set. "'All hands, lower the mainsail!' Five minutes later it was down, and— we sailed under mizzen topsails and tagallantsails. Well, Penelon, said the captain, what makes you shake your head? Why, I says, I think you still have too much on. I think you're right, answered he. We shall have a gale. A gale? More than that, we shall have a tempest, or I don't know what's what. You can see the wind coming like the dust at Montreton. "'Luckily the captain understood his business. "'Take in two reefs and topsails,' cried the captain. "'Let go the bullens. Haul the brace. Lower the tagallant sails. Haul out the reef tackles on the yards.' "'That was not enough for those latitudes,' said the Englishman. "'I should have taken four reefs and the topsails and furled the spanaker. "'His firm, sonorous, and unexpected voice made everyone start.' Penelon put his hand over his eyes, then stared at the man who thus criticized the maneuvers of his captain. "'We did better than that, sir,' said the old sailor respectfully. "'We put up the helm to run before the tempest ten minutes after we struck our topsails and scudded under bare poles.' "'The vessel was very old to risk that,' said the Englishman. "'Eh, hey, it was that that did the business.' After pitching heavily for twelve hours, we sprung a leak. Penelon, said the captain, I think we are sinking. Give me the helm and go down into the hold. I gave him the helm and descended. There was already three feet of water. All hands to the pumps! I shouted, but it was too late, and it seemed that the more we pumped, the more came in. Ah, said I, after four hours' work, since we are sinking, let us sink. We can die but once. "'That's the example you set, Penelon,' cries the captain. "'Well, well, wait a minute.' He went into his cabin and came back with a brace of pistols. "'I'll blow the brains out of the first man who leaves the pump,' said he. "'Well done,' said the Englishman. "'There's nothing that gives you so much courage as good reasons,' continued the sailor. And during that time the wind had abated, the sea had gone down, but the water kept rising. Not much, only two inches an hour, but still it rose. Two inches an hour does not seem much, but in twelve hours that makes two feet, and three we had before, that makes five. Come, said the captain, we have all done all in our power, and Monsieur Morel will have nothing to reproach us with. We have tried to save the ship, let us now save ourselves. To the boats, my lads, as quick as you can. Now, continued Penelon. 
Now you see, Monsieur Morel, a sailor is attached to the ship, but still more to his life, so we did not wait to be told twice. The more so that the ship was sinking under us and seemed to say, Get along, save yourselves. We soon launched the boat, and all eight of us got into it. The captain descended last. Nor, rather, he did not descend, he would not quit the vessel. So I took him round the waist, and I threw him into the boat, and then I jumped after him. It was time, for just as I jumped the deck burst with a noise like the broadside of a man-of-war. Ten minutes after, she pitched forward, then the other way, and spun round and round, and then good-bye to the Farron. As for us, we were three days without anything to eat or drink, so that we began to think of drawing lots who would feed the rest. And then we saw La Gironde, and made signals of distress. She perceived us, made for us, and took us all on board. There now, Monsieur Morel, that's the whole truth, on the honor of a sailor. Is it not true, you fellows there? A general murmur of approbation showed that the narrator had faithfully detailed their misfortunes and sufferings. Well, well, said Monsieur Morel. I know there was no one in fault but destiny. It was the will of God that this should happen, blessed be his name. What wages do to you? Oh, do not let us talk of that, Monsieur Morel. Yes, but we will talk of it. Well, then, three months, said Penelon. Cocles, pay two hundred francs to each of these good fellows, said Morel. At another time, added he, I should have said, give them besides two hundred francs over as a present, but times have changed, and the little money that remains to me is not my own. Penelon turned to his companions and exchanged a few words with them. As for that, Monsieur Morel, said he, again turning his quid, as for that. As for what? The money. Well, well, we all say that Fifty francs would be enough for us at present, and we will wait for the rest. Oh, thanks, my friends. Thanks, cried Morel gratefully. Take it, take it, and if you can find another employer, enter his service. You are free to do so. These last words produced a prodigious effect on the seaman. Penelon nearly swallowed his quid. Fortunately, he recovered. What? "'Monsieur Morel?' said he in a low voice. "'You send us away? You are then angry with us?' "'No, no,' said Monsieur Morel. "'I am not angry. Quite the contrary. "'And I do not send you away, but I have no more ships, "'and therefore I do not want any sailors.' "'No more ships?' returned Penelon. "'Well, then you'll build some, and we'll wait for you.' I have no money to build ships with, Penelon, said the poor owner mournfully, so I cannot accept your kind offer. No more money? Well, then you must not pay us. We can scud like the Farron under bare poles. Enough, enough, cried Morel, almost overpowered. Leave me, I pray you, and we shall meet again in a happier time. Emmanuel, go with them and see that my orders are executed. At least... "'We shall see each other again, Monsieur Morel?' asked Penelon. "'Yes, I hope so, at least. Now go.' He made a sign to Cocles, who went first. The seaman followed him, and Emmanuel brought up the rear. "'Now,' said the owner to his wife and daughter, "'leave me, for I wish to speak with this gentleman.' And he glanced toward the clerk of Thompson and French, who had remained motionless in the corner during the scene, in which he had taken no part except the few words we have mentioned. The two women looked at this person, whose presence had been entirely forgotten, and retired. But as she left the apartment, Julie gave the stranger a supplicating glance, to which she replied by a smile that an indifferent spectator would have been surprised to see on his stern features. The two men were left alone. "'Well, sir,' said Morel, sinking into a chair. You have heard all. I have nothing further to tell you. I see, returned the Englishman. 
that a fresh and unmerited misfortune has overwhelmed you, and this only increases my desire to serve you. Oh, sir, cried Morel, let me see, continued the stranger, I am one of your largest creditors. Your bills, at least, are the first that will fall due. Do you wish for time to pay? A delay would save my honor, and consequently my life. How long a delay do you wish for? Morel reflected. Two months, said he. I will give you three, replied the stranger. But, asked Morel, will the house of Thompson and French consent? Oh, I take everything on myself. Today is the 5th of June. Yes. Well, renew these bills up to the 5th of September, and on the 5th of September at eleven o'clock, the hand of the clock pointed to eleven, I shall come to receive the money. I shall expect you, returned Morel, and I will pay you, or I shall be dead. These last words were uttered in so low a tone that the stranger could not hear them. The bills were renewed, the old ones destroyed, and the poor shipowner found himself with three months before him to collect his resources. The Englishman received his thanks with the phlegm particular to his nation, and Morel, overwhelming him with a grateful blessing, conducted him to the staircase. The stranger met Julie on the stairs. She pretended to be descending, but in reality was waiting for him. "'Oh, sir!' said she, clasping her hands. "'Mademoiselle,' said the stranger, "'one day you will receive a letter signed Sinbad the Sailor. Do exactly what the letter bids you, however strange it may appear.' "'Yes, sir,' returned Julie. "'Do you promise?' "'I swear to you I will.' It is well. Adieu, mademoiselle. Continue to be the good, sweet girl you are at the present, and I have great hopes that heaven will reward you by giving you Emmanuel for a husband. Julie uttered a faint cry, blushed like a rose, and leaned against the baluster. The stranger waved his hand, and continued to descend. In the court he found Penelon, who, with a rouleau of a hundred francs in either hand, seemed unable to make up his mind to retain them. "'Come with me, my friend,' said the Englishman. "'I wish to speak to you.'" So ends Chapter 29, The House of Morel and Son. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Maria Tafidis. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 30. The 5th of September. The extension provided for by the agent of Thompson and French, at the moment when Morel expected it least, was to the poor ship owner so decided a stroke of good fortune that he almost dared to believe that fate was at length grown weary of wasting her spite upon him. The same day he told his wife, Emmanuel and his daughter, all that had occurred and a ray of hope, if not of tranquillity, returned to the family. Unfortunately, however, Morel had not only engagements with the house of Thompson and French, who had shown themselves so considerate towards him, and as he had said, in business he had correspondence and not friends. When he thought the matter over, he could by no means account for this generous conduct on the part of Thompson and French towards him, and could only attribute it to some such selfish arguments as this. We had better help a man who owes us nearly 300,000 francs, and have those 300,000 francs at the end of three months, than hasten his ruin, and get only six or eight percent of our money back again. Unfortunately, whether through envy or stupidity, 
all Morel's correspondents did not take this view, and some even came to a contrary decision. The bills signed by Morel were presented at his office with scrupulous exactitude, and thanks to the delay granted by the Englishman, were paid by Cockle with equal punctuality. Cockle thus remained in his accustomed tranquillity. It was Morel alone who remembered with alarm that if he had to repay on the 15th the 50,000 francs of M. de Beauville, and on the 30th the 32,500 francs of bills, for which, as well as the debt due to the inspector of prisons, he had time granted, he must be a ruined man. The opinion of all the commercial men was that, under the reverses which had successively weighed down Morel, it was impossible for him to remain solvent. Great, therefore, was the astonishment when at the end of the month he cancelled all his obligations with his usual punctuality. Still confidence was not restored to all minds, and the general opinion was that a complete ruin of the unfortunate shipowner had been postponed only until the end of the month. The month passed, and Morel made extraordinary efforts to get in all his resources. Formerly his paper, at any date, was taken with confidence and was even in request. Morel now tried to negotiate bills at ninety days only, and none of the banks would give him credit. Fortunately, Morel had some funds coming in on which he could rely, and as they reached him, he found himself in a condition to meet his engagements when the end of July came. The agent of Thompson and French had not been again seen at Marseille. The day after, or two days after his visit to Morel, he had disappeared, and as in that city he had had no intercourse but with the mayor, the inspector of prisons, and Monsieur Morel, his departure left no trace except in the memories of these three persons. As to the sailors of the Pharaon, they must have found snug berths elsewhere, for they also had disappeared. Captain Gomar, recovered from his illness, had returned from Palma. He delayed presenting himself at Morel's, but the owner, hearing of his arrival, went to see him. The worthy ship owner knew, from Penelon's recital, of the captain's brave conduct during the storm, and tried to console him. He brought him also the amount of his wages, which Captain Goma had not dared to apply for. As he descended the staircase, Morel met Penelon, who was going up. Penelon had, it would seem, made good use of his money, for he was newly clad. When he saw his employer, the worthy tower seemed much embarrassed, drew on one side into the corner of the landing place, passed his quid from one cheek to the other, stared stupidly with his great eyes, and only acknowledged the squeeze of the hand which Morel as usual gave him by a slight pressure in return. Morel attributed Penelon's embarrassment to the elegance of his attire. It was evident the good fellow had not gone to such an expense on his own account. He was no doubt engaged on board some other vessel, and thus his bashfulness arose from the fact of his not having, if we may so express ourselves, worn mourning for the pharaoh longer. Perhaps he had come to tell Captain Gomar of his good luck, and to offer him employment from his new master. Worthy fellows, said Morel as he went away, may your new master love you as I loved you, and be more fortunate than I have been. August rolled by an unceasing efforts on the part of Morel to renew his credit or revive the old. On the 20th of August, it was known at Marseille that he had left town in the mail coach, and then it was said that the bills would go to protest at the end of the month, and that Morel had gone away and left his chief clerk Emmanuel and his cashier cock to meet the creditors. But contrary to all expectation, when the 31st of August came, the house opened as usual, and cock appeared behind the grating on the counter, examined all bills presented with the usual scrutiny, 
and from first to last paid all with the usual precision. There came in, moreover, two drafts which M. Morel had fully anticipated, and which Cock paid as punctually as the bills which the ship-owner had accepted. All this was incomprehensible, and then, with a the tenacity peculiar to prophets of bad news, the failure was put off until the end of September. On the first, Morel returned. He was awaited by his family with extreme anxiety, for from this journey to Paris they hoped great things. Morel had thought of Danglars, who was now immensely rich, and had laid on a great obligations to Morel in former days, since to him it was owing that Danglars entered the service of the Spanish banker, with whom he had laid the foundations of his vast wealth. It was said at this moment that Danglars was worth from six to eight millions of francs, and had unlimited credit. Danglars, then, without taking a crown from his pocket, could save Morel. He had but to pass his word for a loan, and Morel was saved. Morel had long thought of Danglars, but had kept away from some instinctive motive, and had delayed as long as possible availing himself of this last resource. And Morel was right, for he returned home crushed by the humiliation of a refusal. Yet on his arrival Morel did not utter a complaint or say one harsh word. He embraced his weeping wife and daughter, pressed Emmanuel's hand with friendly warmth, and then going to his private room on the second floor, had sent for Cockle. Then said the two women to Emmanuel, were indeed rude. It was agreed in a brief council held among them that Julie should write to her brother, who was in garrison at Nîmes, to come to them as speedily as possible. The poor women felt instinctively that they required all their strength to support the blow that impended. Besides, Maximilien Morel, though hardly two and twenty, had great influence over his father. He was a strong-minded, upright young man. At the time when he decided on his profession, his father had no desire to choose for him, but had consulted young Maximilien's taste. He had at once declared for a military life, and had in consequence studied hard, passed brilliantly through the polytechnic school, and left it as sub-lieutenant of the 53rd of the line. For a year he had held this rank, and expected promotion on the first vacancy. In his regiment, Maximilien Morel was noted for his rigid observance, not only of the obligations imposed on a soldier, but also of the duties of a man, and he thus gained the name of the Stoic. We need hardly say that many of those who gave him this epithet repeated it because they had heard it and did not even know what it meant. This was the young man whom his mother and sister called to their aid, to sustain them under the serious trial which they felt they would soon have to endure. They had not mistaken the gravity of this event, for the moment after Morel had entered his private office with Coq, Julie saw the latter leave it pale, trembling, and his features betraying the utmost consternation. She would have questioned him as he passed by her, but the worthy creature hastened down the staircase with unusual precipitation, and only raised his hands to heaven and exclaimed, Oh, mademoiselle, mademoiselle, what a dreadful misfortune! Who could ever have believed it? A moment afterwards, Julie saw him go upstairs carrying two or three heavy ledgers, a portfolio, and a bag of money. Morel examined the ledgers, opened the portfolio, and counted the money. All his funds amounted to six thousand or eight thousand francs, his bills receivable up to the fifth, to four thousand or five thousand, which, making the best of everything, gave him fourteen thousand francs to meet debts amounting to two hundred and eighty-seven thousand and five hundred francs. He had not even the means for making a possible settlement on account. However, when Morel went down to his dinner, he appeared very calm. This calmness was more alarming to the two women than the deepest dejection would have been. After dinner, Morel usually went out and used to take his coffee at the Faucillon Club and read the semaphore. This day, he did not leave the house but returned to his office. 
as to Cockley seemed completely bewildered. For part of the day he went into the courtyard, seated himself on a stone with his head bare and exposed to the blazing sun. Emmanuel tried to comfort the women, but his eloquence faltered. The young man was too well acquainted with the business of the house not to feel that a great catastrophe hung over the Morel family. Night came. The two women had watched, hoping that when he left his room, Morel would come to them, but they heard him pass before their door and try to conceal the noise of his footsteps. They listened. He went to his sleeping room and fastened the door inside. Madame Morel sent her daughter to bed, and half an hour after Julie had retired, she rose, took off her shoes, and went stealthily along the passage to see through the keyhole what her husband was doing. In the passage she saw a retreating shadow. It was Julie, who, uneasy herself, had anticipated her mother. The young lady went with Madame Morel. "'He's writing,' she said. They had understood each other without speaking. Madame Morel looked again through the keyhole. Morel was writing, but Madame Morel remarked, what her daughter had not observed, that her husband was writing on stamped paper. The terrible idea that he was writing his will flashed across her. She shuddered, and yet had not strength to utter a word. Next day, Monsieur Morel seemed as calm as ever, went into his office as usual, came to his breakfast punctually, and then after dinner he placed his daughter beside him, took her head in his arms and held her for a long time against his bosom. In the evening, Julie told her mother that although he was apparently so calm, she had noticed that her father's heart beat violently. The next two days passed in much the same way. On the evening of the 4th of September, Monsieur Morel asked his daughter for the key of his study. Julie trembled at this request, which seemed to her of bad omen. Why did her father ask for this key, which she always kept, and which was only taken from her in childhood as a punishment? The young girl looked at Morel. What have I done wrong, father, she said, that you should take this key from me? Nothing, my dear, replied the unhappy man, with tears starting to his eyes at this simple question. Nothing. Only I want it. Julie made a pretense to feel for the key. I must have left it in my room, she said. And she went out, but instead of going to her apartment, she hastened to consult Emmanuel. Do not give this key to your father, said he, and tomorrow morning, if possible, do not quit him for a moment. She questioned Emmanuel, but he knew nothing or would not say what he knew. During the night, between the 4th and 5th of September, Madame Morel remained listening for every sound and until three o'clock in the morning, she heard her husband pacing the room in great agitation. It was three o'clock when he threw himself on the bed. The mother and daughter passed the night together. They had expected Maximilien since the previous evening. At eight o'clock in the morning, Morel entered their chamber. He was calm, but the agitation of the night was legible in his pale and careworn visage. They did not dare to ask him how he had slept. Morel was kinder to his wife, more affectionate to his daughter, than he had ever been. He could not cease gazing at and kissing the sweet girl. Julie, mindful of Manuel's request, was following her father when he quitted the room, but he said to her quickly, Remain with your mother, dearest. Julie wished to accompany him. I wish you to do so, said he. This was the first time Morel had ever so spoken but he said it in a tone of paternal kindness, and Julie did not dare to disobey. She remained at the same spot, standing mute and motionless. An instant afterwards, the door opened. She felt two arms encircle her, and a mouth pressed her forehead. She looked up and uttered an exclamation of joy. "'Maximilien, my dearest brother!' she cried. At these words, Madame Morel rose and threw herself into her son's arms. "'Mother!' said the young man, looking alternately at Madame Morel and her daughter. What has occurred? What has happened? Your letter has frightened me, and I have come hither with all speed. Julie, said Madame Morel, making a sign to the young man, go and tell your father that Maximilien has just arrived. The young lady rushed out of the apartment. 
but on the first step of the staircase she found a man holding a letter in his hand. "'Are you not Mademoiselle Julie Morel?' inquired the man, with a strong Italian accent. "'Yes, sir,' replied Julie, with hesitation. "'What is your pleasure? I do not know you.' "'Read this letter,' he said, handing it to her. Julie hesitated. "'It concerns the best interest of your father,' said the messenger. The young girl hastily took the letter from him. She opened it quickly and read, "'Go this moment to the Allée de Meillon. Enter the house number fifteen. Ask the porter for the key of the room on the fifth floor. Enter the apartment. Take from the corner of the mantelpiece purse netted in red silk, and give it to your father. It is important that he should receive it before eleven o'clock. You promised to obey me implicitly. Remember your oath. Sing by the sailor.' The young girl uttered a joyful cry, raised her eyes, and looked round to question the messenger, but he had disappeared. She cast her eyes again over the note to peruse it a second time, and saw there was a postscript. She read, It is important that you should fulfill this mission in person and alone. If you go accompanied by any other person, or should anyone else go in your place, the porter will reply that does not know anything about it. This postscript decreased greatly the young girl's happiness. Was there nothing to fear? Was there not some snare laid for her? Her innocence had kept her in ignorance of the dangers that might assail a young girl of her age. But there is no need to know danger in order to fear it. Indeed, it may be observed that it is usually unknown perils that inspire the greatest terror. Julie hesitated and resolved to take counsel. Yet through a singular impulse, it was neither to her mother nor her brother that she applied, but to Emmanuel. She hastened down and told him what had occurred on the day when the agent of Thompson and French had come to her father's, related the scene on the staircase, repeated the promise she had made, and showed him the letter. "'You must go, then, mademoiselle,' said Emmanuel. "'Go there?' murmured Julie. "'Yes, I will accompany you. But did you not read that I must be alone?' said Julie. And you shall be alone, replied the young man. I will await you at the corner of the Rue de Musée, and if you are so long absent as to make me uneasy, I will hasten to rejoin you, and woo to him of whom you shall have cause to complain to me. Then, Emmanuel, said the young girl with hesitation, it is your opinion that I should obey this invitation? Yes. Did not the messenger say your father's safety depended upon it? But what danger threatens him, then, Emmanuel, she asked. Emmanuel hesitated a moment, but his desire to make Julie decide immediately made him reply. Listen, he said. Today is the 5th of September, is it not? Yes. Today, then, at 11 o'clock, your father has nearly 300,000 francs to pay. Yes, we know that. Well, then, continued Emmanuel, we have not... Fifteen thousand francs in the house. What will happen then? Why, if today, before eleven o'clock, your father has not found someone who will come to his aid, who will be compelled at twelve o'clock to declare himself a bankrupt. Oh, come then, come, cried she, hastening away with the young man. During this time, Madame Morel had told her son everything. The young man knew quite well that, after the succession of misfortunes which had befallen his father, great changes had taken place in the style of living and housekeeping. But he did not know that matters had reached such a point. He was thunderstruck. Then rushing hastily out of the apartment, he ran upstairs, expecting to find his father in his study. But he rapped there in vain. While he was yet at the door of the study, he heard the bedroom door open, turned, and so his father. Instead of going direct to his study, M. Morel had returned to his bedchamber, which he was only this moment quitting. Morel uttered a cry of surprise at the sight of his son, of whose arrival he was ignorant. He remained motionless on the spot, pressing with his left hand something he had concealed under his coat. Maximilien sprang down the staircase, and threw his arms round his father's neck, but suddenly recalled and placed his right hand on Morel's breast. "'Father?' 
exclaimed, turning pale as death. "'What are you going to do with that brace of pistols under your coat?' "'Oh, this is what I feared,' said Morel. "'Father, father, in heaven's name!' exclaimed the young man. "'What are these weapons for?' "'Maximilien,' replied Morel, looking fixedly at his son. "'You are a man and a man of honor. "'Come, and I will explain to you.' "'And with a firm step, Morel went up to his study, "'while Maximilien followed him, trembling as he went. "'Morel opened the door and closed it behind his son, "'then crossing the ante-room, "'went to his desk on which he placed the pistols, "'and pointed with his finger to an open ledger. "'In this ledger was made out an exact balance sheet of his affairs.' Morel had to pay within half an hour two hundred and ninety seven thousand five hundred francs. All he possessed was fifteen thousand two hundred and fifty seven francs. Read, said Morel. The young man was overwhelmed as he read. Morel said not a word. What could he say? What need he add to such a desperate proof and figures? And have you done all that is possible, father, to meet this disastrous result? asked the young man after a moment's pause. I have replied Morel. You have no money coming in on which you can rely? None. You have exhausted every resource? All. And in half an hour, said Maximilien in a gloomy voice, our name is dishonored. Blood washes out dishonor, said Morel. You are right, father. I understand you. Then extending his hand towards one of the pistols, he said, there is one for you, and one for me. Thanks. Morel caught his hand. Your mother! Your sister! Who will support them? A shadow ran through the young man's frame. Father, said, do you reflect that you are bidding me to live? Yes, I do so bid you, answered Morel. It is your duty. You have a calm, strong mind, Maximilien. Maximilien, you are no ordinary man. I make no request or command. I only ask you to examine my position as if it were your own, and then judge for yourself. The young man reflected for a moment. Then an expression of sublime resignation appeared in his eyes, and with a slow and sad gesture he took off his two epaulets, the insignia of his rank. Be it so, then, my father, he said, extending his hand to Morel. Die in peace, my father, I will live. Morel was about to cast himself on his knees before his son, but Maximilien caught him in his arms, and those two noble hearts were pressed against each other for a moment. You know it is not my fault, said Morel. Maximilien smiled. I know, father. You are the most honorable man I have ever known. Good, my son. And now there is no more to be said. Go and rejoin your mother and sister. My father, said the young man, bending his knee. Bless me. Morel took the head of his son between his two hands, drew him forward, and kissing his forehead several times, he said, Oh, yes, yes, I bless you in my own name, and in the name of three generations of irreproachable men, who say through me, The edifice which misfortune has destroyed, providence may build up again. On seeing me die such a death, the most inexorable will have pity on you. To you, perhaps, they will accord the time they have refused to me. Then... Do your best to keep our name free from dishonor. Go to work, labor, young man, struggle ardently and courageously. Live yourself, your mother and sister, with the most rigid economy, so that from day to day the property of those whom I leave in your hands may augment and fructify. Reflect how glorious a day it will be, how grand, how solemn that day of complete restoration, on which you will say in this very office, my father died because he could not do what I have this day done, but he died calmly and peaceably, because in dying he knew what I should do. My father, my father, cried the young man, why should you not live? If I live, all would be changed. If I live, interest would be converted into doubt, pity into hostility. If I live, I am only a man who has broken his word, failed in his engagements, in fact, only a bankrupt. If, on the contrary, I die, remember, Maximilien, my corpse is that of an honest but unfortunate man. Living, my best friends would avoid my house. Dead, all Marseille will follow me in tears to my last home. Living, 
you would feel shame at my name. Dead, you may raise your head and say, I am the son of him you killed, because for the first time he has been compelled to break his word. The young man uttered a groan, but appeared resigned. And now, said Morel, leave me alone and endeavor to keep your mother and sister away. Will you not see my sister once more? asked Maximilian. The last by final hope was concealed by the young man in the effect of this interview, and therefore he had suggested it. Morel shook his head. I saw her this morning, and bade her adieu. I will not put tickle commands to live with me, my father, inquired Maximilian in a faltering voice. Yes, my son, and a sacred command. Say it, my father. The house of Thompson and French is the only one who, from humanity, or it may be selfishness, it is not for me to read men's hearts, has had any pity for me. Its agent will in ten minutes present himself to receive the amount of the bill of 287,500 francs, and will not say granted but offer me three months. Let this house be the first repaid, my son, and respect this man. Father, I will, said Maximilian. And now once more adieu, said Morin. Go, leave me. I would be alone. You will find my will in the secretary in my bedroom. The young man remained standing and motionless, having by the force of will another power of execution. Hear me, Maximilian, said his father. Suppose I was a soldier like you, and ordered to carry a certain redoubt, and you knew I must be killed in the assault. Would you not say to me, as you said just now, Go, father, for you are dishonored by delay, and death is preferable to shame. Yes, yes, said the young man, yes. And once again embracing his father with convulsive pressure, he said, Be it so, my father. And he rushed out of the study. When his son had left him, Morel remained an instant standing with his eyes fixed on the door, and putting forth his arm, pulled the bell. After a moment's interval, Cock appeared. It was no longer the same man. The fearful revelations of the three last days had crushed him. The thought the house of Morel is about to stop payment would burn him to the earth more than twenty years would otherwise have done. My worthy Cock, said Morel, in a tone impossible to describe, do you remain in the antechamber? When the gentleman who came three months ago, the agent of Thompson and French, arrives, announce his arrival to me. Cock made no reply, he made a sign with his head, went into the empty room, and seated himself. Morel fell back in his chair, his eyes fixed on the clock. There were seven minutes left, that was all. The hand moved on with incredible rapidity. He seemed to see its motion. What passed in the mind of this man at the supreme moment of his agony cannot be told in words. He was still comparatively young, he was surrounded by the loving care of a devoted family, but he had convinced himself by a course of reasoning, illogical, perhaps, yet certainly plausible, that he must separate himself from all he held dear in the world, even life itself. To form the slightest idea of his feeling, one must have seen his face, with its expression of enforced resignation, and its tear moistened eyes, raised to heaven. The minute hand moved on. The pistols were loaded. He stretched forth his hand, took one up, and murmured his daughter's name. Then he laid it down, seized his pen, and wrote a few words. It seemed to him as if he had not taken a sufficient farewell of his beloved daughter. Then he turned again to the clock, counting time not, not by minutes, but by seconds. He took up the deadly weapon again, his lips parted and his eyes fixed on the clock, and then shuddered at the click of the trigger as he cocked the pistol. At this moment of mortal anguish, the cold sweat came forth upon his brow, a pain stronger than death clutched at his heart strength. He heard the door of the staircase creak on its hinges, the clock gave its warning strike eleven, the door of his study opened. Morel did not turn round, expecting these words of Cockle, the agent of Thompson and French. He placed the muzzle of the pistol between his teeth. Suddenly he heard a cry. It was his daughter's voice. He turned and saw Julie. The pistol fell from his hand. My father, cried the young girl, out of breath and half dead with joy. Saved, you are saved. And she threw herself into his arms, holding in her extended hand a red, netted silk purse. Saved, my child, said Morel. What do you mean? Yes, saved, saved, see, see, said the young girl. 
Morel took the purse, and started as he did so, for a vague remembrance reminded him that it once belonged to himself. At one end was a receipt and bill for the two hundred and eighty-seven thousand francs, and at the other was a diamond as large as a hazelnut, with these words on a small slip of parchment. Julie's diary. Morel passed his hand over his brow. It seemed to him a dream. At this moment the clock struck eleven. He felt as if a stroke of the hammer fell upon his heart. Explain, my child, he said, explain, my child. Where did you find this purse? In a house in the Allée de Meillon, number 15, on the corner of a mantelpiece, in a small room on the fifth floor. But, cried Morel, this purse is not yours. Julie handed to her father the letter she had received in the morning. And did you go alone? said Morel, after he had read it. Emmanuel accompanied me, father. He was to have waited for me at the corner of the Rue de Musée. But strange to say, he was not there when I returned. Monsieur Morel, exclaimed a voice on the stairs, Monsieur Morel. It is his voice, said Julie. At this moment, Emmanuel entered, his countenance full of animation and joy. The pharaoh, he cried, the pharaoh. What, what, the pharaoh? Are you mad, Emmanuel? You know the vessel is lost. The pharaoh, sir, they signal the pharaoh. The pharaoh is entering the harbor. Morel fell back in his chair. His strength was failing him. His understanding, weakened by such events, refused to comprehend such incredible, unheard of, fabulous facts. But his son came in. Father, cried Maxime, how could you say the pharaoh was lost? The lookout has signaled her, and they say she is now coming into port. My dear friend, said Morel, if this be so, it must be a miracle of heaven. Impossible, impossible. But what was real and not less incredible was the purse he had in his hand, the acceptance received in it. A splendid diamond. Ah, oh, sir, exclaimed Coq, what can it mean? The farm. Come, dear ones, said Morel, rising from his seat. Let us go and see, and heaven have pity upon us if it be false intelligence. They all went out, and on the stairs met Madame Morel, who had been afraid to go up into the study. In a moment they were at the Canabier. There was a crowd on the pier. All the crowd gave way before Morel. The farm, the farm, said every voice. And wonderful to see, in front of the tower of Saint Jean, was a ship bearing on a stern these words, printed in white letters, the Pharaon, Morel and Son of Marseille. She was the exact duplicate of the other Pharaon, and loaded as they had been with cochineal and indigo. She cast anchor, clued up sails, and on the deck was Captain Gomard giving orders, and Gouleau Penelon making signals to Monsieur Morel. To doubt any longer was impossible. There was the evidence of the senses and ten thousand persons who came to corroborate the testimony. As Morel and his son embraced on the pier ahead, in the presence and amid the applause of the whole city witnessing this event, a man with his face half covered by a black beard, and who, concealed behind the sentry box, watched the scene with delight, uttered these words in a low tone. Be happy, noble heart. Be blessed for all the good thou hast done and will do hereafter, and let my gratitude remain in obscurity like your good deeds. And with a smile expressive of supreme content, he left his hiding place, and without being observed, descended one of the flights of steps provided for debarkation, and hailing through towns, shouted, Jacopo, Jacopo, Jacopo! Then a launch came to shore, took him on board, and conveyed him to a yacht splendidly fitted up on whose desk he sprung with the activity of a sailor. Thence he once again looked towards Morel, who, weeping with joy, was shaking hands most cordially with all the crowd round him, and thanking with a look the unknown benefactor whom he seemed to be seeking in the sky. And now, said the unknown, farewell, kindness, humanity and gratitude, farewell to all the feelings that expel the heart. I have been heaven's substitute to recompense the good. Now the god of vengeance yields to me his power to Punish the wicked. By these words, he gave a signal, and as if only awaiting this signal, the yacht instantly put out to sea. End of chapter thirty.